welcome back to my channel. In today's video, I have a bit of a different video for y'all. It is going to be an interview with my good friend, Carol. She and I got close over on Instagram. She has released 85 pounds. We don't like to say lost because she's never planning on finding it again. This Carol. video is a bit long because Carol has so much awesome knowledge and information to share with everyone. And I didn't want to leave anything out. So I will be putting timestamps if you'd like to kind of watch certain parts of the video and skip around and maybe come back and watch the rest and I hope that y'all enjoy today's interview. Just a quick reminder, neither of us are medical professionals. If you are on certain medications or have certain health issues, you may need to speak with a professional before attempting to fast. Hey Carol, thank you so much for coming on and doing this interview with me today. Thank you so much for having me, Christina. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, really. So I wanted to have Carol on to do this interview uh, because she's released 85 pounds with extended fasting and Carol has kept that weight off now and she lives a fasting focused lifestyle. Before we get started with your story. Go ahead and just tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from. Are you married? Do you have kids? I'm 55. I have two grown daughters and I have two granddaughters. I'm married to like the most wonderful man in the world. Uh, he supports me in everything I do. Right now I'm doing a lot of coaching on Instagram for a lot of women. I coach for free. I don't charge anything because like you'll find out in this interview, the first year and a half, I was alone during my journey and I don't want anybody out there to be alone. I would like to help and support in any ways that I can. So I support women. I encourage them. I hopefully empower them. I went from 194 pounds to 110 and it's been an incredible, exciting journey. So I just want to help as much as I can. And Carol, you've actually just completed your 650th documented fast, right? You were fasting for about six months before you found the app. And is it, which, is it the life app that you're on? The life I'm app. On two, yeah. So I always get confused, the life app. And so you started documenting your fast like six months into your journey. And so you've done 650 since that time. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> That's a huge yeah. accomplishment. I don't think very many people can say that. How many do you think you've actually done? Like if you were to go back and add in your first six months, what do you think your number actually is? I don't know, but I have been fasting for three years and three months. So I, I kind of calculated that probably within the next year, maybe year and a half, I'll probably make it to a thousand fast, but we'll have to see. I'm not in a rush. There's no rush. There's no end game here. So intermittent fasting has been a hot topic, but I'm kind of curious how you came across extended fasting because that's what you've done to release your weight. And I don't think it's really like that well known. Like when people talk about doing rolling fast, which are completing a fast, eating one meal and going right back into another fast. Like most people aren't familiar with that. So how did you come across that style of fasting? I just evolved on my own. Um, when I, when I first started, I kind of came across fasting by accident because uh, I was 194 pounds and I was exercising like crazy. Like every day I was exercising and I ended up getting plantar fasciitis in my foot and it just crippled me up. But I kept, I kept um, exercising anyway. And I was taking Tylenol and Advil and Tylenol and Advil day and night. And even in the middle of the night, I'd wake up and take it. It was horrible. And so I went on uh, YouTube and I came across Dr. Berg and uh, he was telling, telling how to kind of fix your plantar fasciitis and it worked. So after I healed my foot, I went back on and I thought, well, what else does this gentleman know? And that's when I came across the fasting and the fasting lifestyle. And then I went a little deeper into it and came across Dr. Jason Fung and learned some more with that, did some reading, did some, did some more videos and um, just started doing fasting on my own. I didn't have Instagram. I didn't have anyone to talk to or discuss it. You have to be very careful when you first start um, fasting, who you discuss it with, who you tell, because people will you know, they will get scared for you and they will start telling you that it's not safe and it's dangerous and you're going to hurt yourself and you're going to lose muscle and you're going to, you know, faint and just all kinds of um, mythical things they'll say because they don't know any better. They haven't read, they haven't researched, they don't understand it at all. Um, if you're not in the fasted lifestyle, um, you have to, again, you have to be very careful who you, who you discuss it with. Well, I was going to ask you that about your husband. Whenever you first started fasting, did he think you were crazy? Because my husband thought I was crazy at first. Yeah, my husband was a little nervous um, because he, did, he didn't know anything about it either. Neither did I. I was, I was researching on my own. Like I said, I was watching videos on my own. I was reading books. But when I did start learning and I started understanding it more, I would come to him and I would say things to him and I, I would talk to him about it and explain it. And he still wasn't really, you know, too keen on it. So I would purposely put videos on that I had already watched so that he could listen, even though he wasn't really watching, he was still in the room. So I knew he had to listen. And then he started, you know, um, understanding it and started calming down a bit. That's and um, <laughs> he jumped in at six months. 
Um, I asked him, I said, you know, please just try this with me. Try it for two weeks. If you don't like it, I promise I won't bug you again. He tried it for two weeks and he's been um, three years now, almost three, two and a half years, sorry, two and a half years in now. And he loves it. He would never go back to any, any other lifestyle than this. He went from 224 pounds to 185. He went from size 36 pants down to size 30. He still has around 10 pounds to go and um, very, very comfortable in the lifestyle. So, we, so I have someone to do it with, someone to support me a bit. And it's, it's really nice. But again, when I very first started, um, I was completely alone. I had no Instagram. I had no one to talk to. And um, my husband wasn't doing it yet either. So I'd have to go into, the, into a different room when he had his meals and stuff. Um, like I said, I jumped right in first and I would do like two, two or three days, not just one. And then a little bit of time passed and I was into three and four and five day fast. I was scared at first, I thought, you know, because I didn't have a lot of information that even though I was reading and watching TV, uh, videos and stuff, but I was a little bit scared. I thought maybe I'm going to, you know, be walking down the stairs and fall down and faint or maybe I'll be out in public and at the grocery store and I'll just faint because I haven't been eating. And, you know, I was 194 pounds. So to just go from that to into a fast and, and, you know, you don't know what's going to happen until you start reading. And I, and I encourage everybody who's going to fast, everybody who is fasting, who hasn't been reading and learning what actually is happening to and for your body. I really, really highly recommend that you read because not only are you letting go of the weight, you're healing your body and you're doing such amazing things for your body. I really want you to know what you're doing for your body and how it's working uh, to your advantage because again this is a lifestyle this is forever this is not a diet it's not a, any kind of diet it's it's a lifestyle it's a beautiful attainable sustainable lifestyle have you struggled with your weight like for very long or is this kind of more of a new thing for you has it been just the last few years or did you struggle with your weight at all throughout your life as a kid or even into adulthood no i i think that my weight started progressively coming on um, after I turned around 35, maybe 38, because once you hit around 33, 36, that's when our bodies as women, our bodies change unbelievably. That's when our hormones really start to fluctuate. And when your hormones are all out of whack and out of balance, you can't let go of weight. There's just no way you can exercise all you want. You can cut down on your food. It's just not going to work. The whole key, the whole idea with fasting is balancing your hormones. And once your hormones become balanced, that's when you are able to let go of the weight. When you stop food, putting food into the equation, you're giving your body that time, that rest and recovery mode, that time to heal, that time to balance your hormones. And again, that is when you will truly let go of the weight. So take us back to the very beginning when you first started fasting what exactly were you doing I know you jumped kind of into the extended fast but exactly how long were your fast what do you have when you're fasting do you have coffee or just water you know what do you do with that and then when you do eat what what are you eating do you have any food restrictions did you exercise when you were losing this weight so just start at the beginning and just tell us basically everything that you did to release the 85 pounds um, well in the beginning I did have coffee during my fast um, but just one cup I was never really a coffee drinker my whole life I just kind of wanted to drink coffee with my husband just for another thing to share with him so I really didn't enjoy it so just off topic quick I just I just recently quit drinking coffee because it really wasn't doing anything for me I'm a big believer in in uh, clean fasting so now I'm I have nothing except water um, to let go of that weight was because I was doing the extended fasting and, and having my hormones balanced out um, and the weight loss first year and three months roughly I lost the um I believe it was 65 pounds, 63 to 65 pounds because of the fasting, because of uh, balancing the hormones out. I don't have any food restrictions. I just choose what I want to eat and what I don't want to eat. We, my husband and I do not eat a lot of bread because bread is just not very healthy. And if you must have bread, I, I encourage you to toast your bread. It's just better, um, better for you. Oh, um, I didn't know that. I'm not keto per se, but I do like to eat a lot of the keto uh, foods like avocados, um, of course, butter. Um, the healthier fat foods. Um, it's just, it's just better. Our bodies were designed to burn fat. I mean, yeah. I feel like you've just gotten really good at listening to your body when it comes to your diet, it seems like, which I'm yeah. still working on that, but it's amazing too, because three years into it, I'm, I'm now, you know, trying to eat things I used to eat. And now it's like, no, I don't even like this stuff anymore. And it's stuff I used to love. And it, it's not, it's not that I planned to change what I ate. Like now I'm, I'm realizing that it's not really me. It wasn't really my decision. Like it's, it's things changed in my brain and it just made it um, so that my, my tastes evolved and I want healthier foods. I want 
better quality foods and the, the, the stuff that I used to eat is just not, not doing it anymore. Yeah. I've noticed that too. I feel like with fasting, the natural progression that I've really enjoyed is that by telling myself that I can have whatever I want, I've slowly been able to evolve into like not wanting those things anymore where I feel like before, if I would tell myself, you cannot have fast food ever again, you can't have fried food ever again, you know, then that's all I would think about. I would just think about carbs and fast food. But then when I eat something that's fried now, and I know we, we chat on Instagram and you've seen me kind of going along my journey this last year, but it's kind of like, I'll eat something and I feel so bad. And I like pay for it for the next, you know, two, three days. And so I'm like, it's not worth it. And I feel like coming from a place of like, okay, eating this makes me not feel good. It's so much easier just to let those foods go. And it's not restriction. And that's one thing that I really love about fasting. You naturally become healthier as you follow this lifestyle. You're not cutting anything out. You're not restricting food groups. And okay. So you were doing straight off the bat three, four day fast. Is that what you were doing? And then just eating whatever you want. Were you exercising? I actually watched some Dr. Mindy videos and she was saying that, you know, it wasn't really necessary to do a lot of exercise in the first year and to really give your, your body time to um, acknowledge you know, the changes that are going to happen and with fasting, because fasting does put your body under stress. So you want to do your fasting. I, I would recommend the first year that you're just gentle with everything that you do, because your body has to acclimate to what you're doing now, because it's such a huge change for you. So I didn't do a lot of exercising. And I did realize that when I was doing a lot of exercising anyway, before I started fasting, I went from the 194 down to 180 and I could not get past that. Couldn't get under that no matter how hard I worked out, how much I worked out. It was unbelievable until I realized once I started fasting, once I realized and put together the fact that you cannot let go of weight until you balance your hormones again. So the first like year you weren't really doing anything as far as working out was concerned. Now, did you ever have any stalls in your weight loss? Did you ever go like a week or two weeks or anything without losing weight or was it pretty smooth as far as weight loss is concerned? It was pretty smooth as far as, as far as weight loss was concerned because I was very consistent and I was very determined and I stayed with those two and three and four and five day fasts. I didn't do a, a ton of five day, but I did quite a few about five days, but again, two, three, and four days. So I didn't really stall out on the way. I just, that was the whole, that was the whole kicker for, for me with my fasting lifestyle because I just got to a point where I knew the weight was just going to keep coming off. So that's when I stopped and I really thought, well, what else is going on? Because I know this weight is just going to keep going. So there's got to be more to this than just letting go of weight. And that's when I started really delving into reading a lot of books, finding out what is happening to and for my body with regards to fasting, um, just learning how our bodies work, um, why they work with fasting. So that was very educational as well. I love reading. I don't read just about um, fasting. I read um, different books uh, that you can read that really aren't about fasting, but it is about fasting because you are a fasting person. You're in a fasting lifestyle. Learning about our sleep was, this book was amazing. This is why we sleep. And this is by Matthew Walker. This was an amazing book because as far as I can, I'm concerned and I believe, and I, and I teach my ladies that this is sleep and this is fasting and they actually go hand in hand. I mean, you have to have really good quality of sleep. Your hormones need to be balanced. And when you're not sleeping well, you know, your hormones aren't balanced. They're fluctuating. You're, you're stressed, you're tired, you're anxious. Um, so your quality of sleep really needs to be really good. Another book I read was the circadian code, all about our circadian rhythm. And I thought when I, when I bought this book, I thought it was just about when we sleep and why we sleep. And no, it's, it's, it's about so much more. This book is highly recommended by me as well. Um, it, it tells all about our bodies, how our body's organs function, like our, our liver turns on and off at a certain time. Our kidneys turn on and off at a certain time. They don't, they don't shut down. They just turn on and off. They're, they're on a clock. Our entire body's on a clock. We have, you know, trillions of cells in our body they turn on and off at certain times our brain when we sleep that's when our brain has its time to rest and recover and take our short-term memories and put them back into the hippocampus everything we've learned for the day we need sleep because we need that that function of our brain to be able to do and if we're not sleeping that's not happening for us and that causes a, a more stress for us i know a lot of us in weight loss journey myself i'm really guilty of this which fasting has helped but i'm really guilty of focusing so much on the scale that it's like if it doesn't move one day or, you know, a couple of days in a row, it's like, oh, I got to change something up. I have to do something. But because you're focused on your health, I think you can look at that and be like, okay, well, maybe the scale is not moving because my body's doing something else. It's busy with all these other things and dropping weight on the scale is not necessarily like the focus at that point. 
Yeah, sometimes it's not about the scale moving. Sometimes it's about, I, I tell some of my girls that if they, if they want to try uh, finding a pair of pants that are a little bit too small and put them in, in their bedroom on a chair, don't put them in the closet because you're going to forget about them, but find a pair of pants that you really, really like, fell in love with, just got to have them. And there's too small. And then each week you try them on and you just watch your progress and how, how wonderfully fasting will work for you. I have a couple of things hanging in my closet. So it's always exciting to pull something out. And then the other, like a couple of weeks ago, I think I posted on Instagram, I took out an out, like a pant and they were like this far from closing and I put them on and I could pull them out and they were too big. I had waited too long to wear them. So that was oh, pretty exciting. And I was like, well, I can't wear them now because they're too big. That's big-ish. so exciting. That is really <laughs> exciting. I mean, you know. But that's always, yeah, that's always a good thing. So, and yeah. again, my weight hadn't dropped that much since the last time I tried them on. But like you said, those inches. And sometimes I think when you don't see a weight on the scale. I have to get better at measuring myself because sometimes I'll notice the inches are shrinking more. It's like your body's working on like eating up loose skin and all of that kind of stuff. Sometimes your body is so busy healing. You're not really letting go of the weight because like you said, something else is actually happening. Something even better because the healing part of your body and what your body is doing is a huge part of the fasting journey. And you know, that's something I never thought about before, but I've been in a lot of fasting groups where there'll be people who have a lot of health issues and they'll say, I've been fasting for a month and I haven't dropped any weight. And you think like, how is that possible? But that's literally just dawned on me when you were talking is that their body is probably working on healing everything else, getting rid of inflammation, all this stuff. And that's not always going to translate to the scale. So I think that's an important thing for people to remember as well, which again, because you're learning like you're in that mindset and you're not in a like lose this weight as fast as possible, which with fasting, you can lose weight really quickly, which draws a lot of people into the lifestyle. But I think the longer that you fast, the more you realize how good it is for your body and like what amazing things you're doing for your body. And it becomes so much more about health. Absolutely. Absolutely. 100%. I couldn't agree more. So as far as weighing yourself during your journey, did you weigh yourself every day? Uh, I recommend always that you weigh yourself first thing in the morning. I mean, right when you jump out of bed, you go, go to the bathroom and have your ankle and make sure you weigh yourself naked. I don't recommend anybody weighing themselves any other time during the day. That's what I do. <laughs> Absolutely. First thing in the morning, have your tinkle. Like I just said, make sure you're naked, no rings, no jewelry, nothing. Just weigh yourself. I weighed myself every day in the beginning. Um, I, I was not triggered by the scale. So it was fine for me. Some women that I talk to are triggered by the scale. They don't like it, but I encourage them to do use the scale because it is a really healthy tool as long as they're in a good mindset. So if they're you know triggered by the scale in a negative way, I try to get them through. Why is it a negative trigger to you? What can you do now to make it a positive trigger? Because it is a super tool, tool pardon me, in the fasting lifestyle. It's, it's one of a, a few tools that I recommend. For some people, they have to do a ritual of like only weighing once a week or every so often and kind of set a time. But I think that when you do start weighing yourself every day, it really kind of the scale loses its power. Cause I think sometimes the fear of the scale is because we haven't been on it in so long. And some people avoid the scale because they know they're not doing what they should be doing. And so then it just kind of becomes this like fear thing, which I have seen uh, Lisa in our group mentioned that there's a scale where you can weigh yourself every day and have it documented, but you don't see it. So I will try to remember to link that down below because I'm interested in that for people who maybe want to have that data to see how the scale is doing, but they only want to go back and check it, you know, once a week or once a month or something like that. That's an amazing, that's an amazing recommendation. But yeah, if you don't want to, if you don't, I'm not saying that you have to weigh yourself every day. Don't get me wrong. I mean, some women want to, some women don't. But I, I would recommend if you, if you do not want to weigh every day, please at least do weekly. Absolutely. So what about drinking water? Did you monitor how much water that you drink? Cause I get that question a lot as well. Has that changed since you first started to now, like your mindset on how much water you need? My mindset has definitely changed with just information that I've been watching and seeing and reading. It kind of frustrates me that people are like a lot of my new girls that follow me that, I, that I've been coaching they'll listen to things and they'll do what they're, what they're listening to, but they're not really following the correct people or they're not sure. People are saying drink gallons and gallons of water every day, gallons and gallons and gallons of water. And it's like so unnecessary to drink gallons and gallons of water unless you're an athlete or you're working out constantly. Another thing is electrolytes. That's a big hot topic too, is electrolytes. People are taking electrolytes and especially people who are not athletes or working out all the time. And it's just unnecessary to be taking electrolytes because our bodies 
know how to make their own electrolytes. And when women are being told constantly to drink, 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 drink water, drink water all day long, drink water. And then again, all the electrolytes are just being flushed out. And your body, of course, is going to make more, but you're in this fasted state where you're trying to heal and your body's trying to catch up and do these electrolytes. Now, I do recommend electrolytes in, in some waters. I have uh, smart water and there is the light water and it does contain electrolytes. Um, but again, I, I would have this full liter bottle. And if I'm doing a three or a four or a five day fast, which I can't do anymore about four or five days because of my weight. So I don't want to go under the, the 110 that I am now. The most I can norm normally do if I wanted to be extended is a, a 68 or a 69 hour fast. Sure. Like when I was doing the longer fast, I would only drink a third of this bottle on day. I would start on day three, day four and day five. That's not to say I wouldn't drink any other water. I would just use this much of the electrolyte water each day and then also consume regular water. You feel like that helped with your symptoms in the beginning, like headaches. Did you have a lot of like headaches and things like that when you first started? I, I never had, I never had any headaches. Uh, there was times I felt really tired. And then again, I learned about a little bit of pink Himalayan salt. If you take a, a like less than a quarter teaspoon of pink Himalayan salt, just put it on your tongue, let it dissolve. Some people like to put it in their water. I can't drink salt water. No, thank you. So um, I would just put it, uh, you know, less than a quarter teaspoon on my tongue. And I, within 20 minutes, it would pick me back up again. And it was, it was fabulous. It was like a, a kind of a, a, a fun thing for your body because now all of a sudden you were all like kind of duh, drab and, and then it just, it picks you right up. It was really nice. Yeah. That's, that's what I do too. It's just a little bit of the pink Himalayan sea salt and you have to be careful. It's just a little, because yeah. if you put too much and we run into the bathroom, I have made that in the beginning. I made that mistake a lot. I was just like, Oh, it tastes good now, but I can't put it in my water either. It's just it just tastes slimy. I don't like salty water. Knowing that we don't have to do the electric light water was like a huge like relief for me because in the beginning I was doing that because I had seen some advice about it and I'm like, oh, I couldn't stand it. Another thing too is that when, when women are drinking tons and tons and gallons of water a day, they're always, they always end up being up at night two, three, four times a night going to the bathroom. And it's just, it's so bad for your sleep and your rest. And so a lot of my women, I'll recommend, you know, drink your water all day long. And if you, if you can try and cut your water off between five and seven at night, you're certainly not going to dehydrate by the next morning. And if you're so thirsty that you need a drink, have a sip, not have a whole great big glass of water. Cause now you're going to be up again, going to the bathroom at night. And the whole, the whole uh, motive of this was so that you'd be able to sleep through the night. When you get up in the morning, you can have your water again, but it really helped a lot of my women get back into the habit of getting a good night's sleep, good quality sleep. They're not waking up grumpy or tired or frustrated. Why, why they, you know, feel so bad? Well, because you didn't get a good night's sleep. So they're realizing now that cutting off that water between anywhere between five and seven at night works. Now that's what I do. I cut off between five and six at night and I sleep much better at night. I'm not thirsty or dehydrated. I don't feel bad. I don't feel weak or dizzy or anything like that. So again, and I tell my women too, every body and everybody is different. So if you need that drink, I mean, you do you, I tell my ladies, do you, if you need it, you do it. I'm, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just giving you my advice. I'm letting you know that what I've done what my experiences are some of my other ladies experiences I can share. Um, so yeah, water, you drink it when you need it. Again, you don't need gallons and gallons of water every day. Yeah, I think a lot of people accept waking up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom as like an aspect of getting older, but there's so many things that are really just more uh, either habits because you're drinking too late or health. You know, if you're in bad health, you might be waking up to go to the bathroom all the time. And then whenever it comes down to it, you know, you realize, okay, I don't have to do that anymore. I don't have to guzzle water all day long. I was one of those people drinking like a gallon or two every day and fleshing out all of my nutrients. My body wasn't getting anything it needed. And so, yeah, I found that freeing as well too, not having to be measuring it every day. And our bodies, our bodies make its own water as well. Our bodies make that water from the fat cell, the fat storage and stuff like that. So our bodies actually make its own purest water. I mean, our bodies make the purest water. I mean, it doesn't matter what bottled water, where you go to get your water, what fountain, what spring you come across, all water has contaminants in it. I'm not saying don't drink water. I mean, it, I mean, just every single water does have contaminants in it. And that's just, that's just our world. That's just the way it is. When you stop drinking at, you know, five or six at night. And if you do get up in the middle of the night to pee, it might be because your body has now made some extra water and you just need to get rid of that. So, or depending on how much you drank that day, you might still have to be going. When I quit drinking between five and six, I normally will go three or four more times before I go to sleep. 
and then I'm usually cleaned out so I can sleep during the night. So it's nice, com more comfortable that way. Well, that reminds me of something I wanted to ask you as well as you did dry fasting, right? During your, your journey. So when did you start dry fasting and why did you start dry fasting to begin with? I learned about dry fasting. I think I was about three months in and I just started watching some videos for, with Dr. Mindy. Uh, she recommends that you do, you know, you can, if you can, you can do a 24 hour, uh, 24 hour fi uh, dry fast but I took it a little bit further. And sometimes I would do 24, sometimes I would do 36, sometimes I would do 48. I think I did maybe three to five 72 hour dry fast. And those were very beneficial just for tightening up your skin, uh, making your skin feel better, look better, look more healthy. Again, your body makes its own water anyway. So I wasn't very nervous about uh, soft, soft dry fasting at all because I knew it, it was my decision. I'm, I'm looking after myself. And if I got too thirsty, I would just break the soft dry fast, but I would just go through with it. Whatever I had you know, bookmarked on my, on my app. I have two different apps. I have the life app and I have a serene app and the serene app I use when I stop drinking water at like five at night until the next morning. So I keep track of it that way. Uh, but back then I would keep track of my soft dry fast as well. And it was just, it's just very beneficial. I just felt better. It's kind of like, um, it's hard to explain, but you feel lighter. And I don't mean weight wise. I mean, when you're not drinking or putting food into your mouth, it's just, it just, it's a whole other experience. It's, 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 it's beautiful. It's, I can't even describe it. You'd have to go through it. It just, it just feels amazing. Uh, with a soft dry fast, you can brush your teeth. You can wash your hands. You can have a shower. I was going to mention as well, there's a difference in a hard and a soft. I did do a couple of hard dry fasts where I washed my hands, brushed my teeth, had my shower. And then I would go 24 hours without drinking or eating or touching water at all. Unless I ended up going to the bathroom, of course, and I would break my fast. I have to wash my hands. I mean, that's, that's a given, but yeah, I, I did a, quite a few, um, quite a few hard dry fasts as well. They say they're a little more dangerous, but they're not. You just have to use common sense. And if you don't feel good, then you break, you break the fast, just like a, a regular fast. If you don't feel comfortable, if you don't feel like your, your body is responding correctly, you break that fast. This is your body. This is your journey. This is your life. Nobody can tell you what to do or how to do it because you have to learn how to do it for yourself. Because like I said already, every body and everybody is different. So every, everything that we do I mean, something that works for you is not going to work for me. Something that works for me might work for you. You know, every, everything is, is, um, is on the table for experimentation. And I think it has to do with your lifestyle too. So like, what are your goals with fasting? You know, like some people just want to lose 20 pounds and then be able to live and not really think about dieting or anything like that. And so they might stop at a shorter fast. So in maintenance, you're still doing pretty long fast, aren't you? Because you just enjoy it. You feel good doing it. And that's when I thrive. The longer fast is when I really feel my most authentic self. I feel the best with the longer fast. So I, I, I really miss my four and five day fast because those were the ones I thrived in. The first day is kind of difficult still at three, three years and three months. I'm still uh, the first 24 hours is still a little bit rough sometimes. Really? And then going into the second day is not too bad. By the end of the second day, it's great. By the end of the third day, it's beautiful. And then I have to quit again because of my weight. I have to maintain. I don't want to go too far under the 110. But I miss the four and five day because once I hit that 72 hour uh, fast, you just feel amazing. You just, you have unbelievable energy. I, I know it was the ketones and the ketones are fuel for your brains. Ketones are another thing that your body makes for you during fasting. Uh, it's an amazing process as well. Um, autophagy, we should discuss autophagy in a little bit too. That's another amazing process that happens with your body. But yeah, the four and five day fast, by the time I got to my fifth day, and you don't get hungry. That's another thing. People are always scared they're going to be hungry and you're not going to be hungry. Hunger, hunger will come in waves and they normally last about two minutes, just like any other craving or any other wave that you experience, whether you quit smoking or you don't want to have alcohol anymore. These waves will come upon you and you'll be like, oh, I need food. I have to have food. And it's like, just write it out. Put your clock on your phone for two minutes and, or go put some lipstick on, go paint your nails, go, go do something for yourself for two minutes, something for yourself, for you. And you will ride that wave, that hunger wave out. So you won't be hung as the longer you fast hours wise and into the lifestyle, the more you um, experience um, exercising and building on this, what we call the fasting muscle, you will realize that you will not be hungry. It just, it just disappears because another thing is we were never designed to eat three and four meals a day and snack, you know, 15 right. we we're just not, we were just not made to do that sort of thing. Right. Um, so a lot of us in the fasting community, we will eat once a day, um, which is called OMAD one meal a day. There's so many different um, ways to eat 
in this in this lifestyle as well. Another thing is I don't want to scare people and make them think that they have to fast two and three and four and five days to, to have this lifestyle. You can have two meals a day. You can start with three meals a day. And then as you go through your first and second week, you can go down to two meals a day. There are so many different ways to teach you how to do things. I don't want you just thinking, and I'm telling you, you have to fast two, three, four, and five days to see any results and to even get in this lifestyle. It's not like that at all. There's, there's so many different ways to, to bring you into the lifestyle and see where you feel comfortable. There's so many questions to ask you, like how often do you eat? How often do you want to eat? What are your goals? What exactly do you want? How, where do you see yourself in six months? Like it's, it's such an, an amazing experience for me to help. I help a lot of women on Instagram and uh, coach a lot of women. And it's really nice to be able to see them and see their eyes light up when they talk about fasting, see the confusion on their face and help them understand it. And by the time we're done our conversation, they're excited, they're thrilled, they want to do it. They understand it more because again, there's so much misinformation and people are listening to other people out there who, you know, are, are just saying crazy things. And so my women are like, well, I heard this and I heard that. And I'm like, okay, but you know what? That's great. Go and listen, go and learn, but take it in, absorb it, digest it. Think about it. Think about it common sense wise. You know, is this something that you can sustain? Is this something attainable? I'm not against keto in any way, shape or form, but I could never do a keto diet. I don't want to be told what I can and cannot have. I don't want restrictions. I want to live my life how I want to live it. My most authentic self. I want to enjoy it. I want others to enjoy it. I don't want people saying, oh, I can't have it. I want people saying, oh, I'm fasting and I can do this and I can do that. And it still works and I'm comfortable and and I want to teach women as well so that they learn well, they learn properly, it works for them. And now they can go tell someone else and tell someone else and tell someone else. And then those other people can go tell. I don't want to reach the masses all at once. I want to just tell one or two people and, and teach them, you know, and just keep teaching, you know, one or two, one or two, one or two, and just keep going like that so that everybody can also teach other people. I think that knowledge is for sharing. Knowledge is so valuable. Uh, reading my books, sharing what I've learned with my with my books is 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 just wonderful for me to be able to do with women. I don't want to tell women to do things I don't know. I read the books before I actually have women read them because I don't want to just say, oh, go read this book if yeah. I don't know the contents of it or know what it's about or you know if it's even going to help them. So that's another really really exciting uh, part of fasting is is learning and then sharing with women empowering them. Yeah. I think that was a big key for me when it comes to hunger is realizing that it comes and goes in waves and it kind of redefined my perception of what hunger was because I realized so much of what I thought was hunger was just habit. I would realize, okay, I normally eat lunch at 12. So I'm hungry every day at 12 o'clock until I kind of break that habit. And so that was a really big key for me as far as like to really let go of that and be like, okay, I'm not even really hungry. So in the beginning, you feel like you're really hungry a lot. Some people do for me as well. It's the first day that's always even now over a year into almost what a year and a half into my fasting journey. And it's like, okay, I still, I still have those days where I'm like, okay, this first day is the hardest, but it doesn't get harder and harder. Another thing that, uh, that people are really, um, getting, you know, frustrated about is the fact that your stomach starts growling. They think that hunger is related with your stomach growling, but you know what? Your tummy can growl in the middle of the night. Your tummy can growl after you eat. When your tummy is full, your tummy can growl at any time or day of the night. Your tummy growling is not a reason uh, say, you know, for you to say, oh, I'm hungry because my tummy's growling. It's just, that's another myth. It's not, that's not how, how, how it works. If you're not hungry, please don't eat. It's not necessary. If you're not hungry, just don't eat. You don't have to eat just because the clock says five o'clock or noon lunchtime or 9 a.m. or 7 a.m. and you have your breakfast. Um, and again, the, the everybody's saying breakfast is the most important meal of the day and you got to eat. You got to eat first thing in the morning. And that is almost the, the worst time to eat. I mean, that that's why we call fasting. We call it breakfast. You break your fast. Mm -hmm. um, now, I do believe that we should eat um, before noon um, if you're doing if you're doing OMAD or if you're doing uh, extended fasting, I always like to eat my meals before noon because I'll, I'll let you know that later in the day, people are eating suppers, you know, between four and seven at night. This is kind of a, a really tricky subject because I don't want people thinking, well, you know, how can you say that? You know, you don't have a family, you don't have kids, uh, you, you don't, you know, we're going to sit down and eat with everybody. But between five and seven is when your body starts cooling down. That's when your melatonin starts kicking in and you're getting yourself ready for to go to bed. And so now you're putting food into the equation and now you're waking everything up again. 
and now your liver has to work harder, your heart has to beat harder because now you put food in the equation. And now you're now you're gonna go go sit on the couch when you're done eating. You're gonna go to bed when you're done laying on the couch or sitting on the couch watching TV. And now that food is just sitting in you. It's got nowhere to go. Not really. I mean, it's moving, but it's moving so slow. So that's why I recommend to my women if they can eat before noon, because when you eat that meal, you burn it off all day long. So then when you're going to go to bed at night and you have that cooling down period when your body's now making releasing the melatonin before you get ready for bed, you go to bed, you're not uh, gassy, you're not irritable, you're not bloated, you're not feeling terrible. Again, you're going to sleep well, you're going to feel great in the morning, uh, you're not going to wake up feeling, you know, kind of puffy in the face and kind of fuzzy in the head thinking, you know, what's going on? People think maybe they sleep really well when they've eaten their big supper when they go to bed, but you're really not because your body is so busy now, uh, not in that beautiful sleep state because it has to do all this digesting and all this, um, you know, intestinal work. And another thing is when you eat the last mouthful of food that you take, it takes 12 hours for you to digest that food. Think about that when you're, when you're having your meal and, and um, kind of learn about that, do some research on that. I think that's a good point for people. Cause I've seen a lot of people who said that they tried OMAD, you know, one meal a day or 20 to 24 hour fast. And they didn't really want to go any longer than that, but they felt like, they weren't having results. So that's something that people could try who are interested, you know, in fasting, maybe they, they want to eat at least once a day is just to try back in your meal up. Now I still eat it at night a lot, but I do know it's better and healthier to eat earlier in the day. I always have better results on the days that I do choose to eat earlier. And I do make a point if I'm not doing longer fast, if I'm eating more often to try to sometimes make those meals a little bit earlier. Cause I definitely see the benefit um, I eat a lot with my husband at night, so I usually eat my meals at night, but I have noticed it's a big difference when you back that meal up and eat it, you know, earlier in the day. And you do like what, mid-morning, like 10 or 11? Now I usually eat between 9.30 and 11. I was eating between 10 and noon, but... Um, okay. Yeah. So you do like lunchtime and you back it up to basically breakfast. So it's kind of like a brunch, basically. Since I've been reading my sleeping books and my circadian code, and I realize how important sleep is. I, I do really try to, to um, have a new habit of turning my electronics off by 9.30 at night so that I'm able to sleep so that I get a good night's sleep. So I've been waking up quite early, six and seven o'clock in the morning, which is delightful and wonderful. So I, that's why I backed my clock up a bit because I want to eat a little bit earlier because now I've been up a lot longer than before when I read these books and learned about how important sleep was. So that's kind of an exciting part too. And it's funny because my neighbors will smell our steaks at like 9.30 or 10 in the morning. And they're like, what are you guys doing? But you can't tell them what you're doing. Neighbors yeah, probably think you're nuts. Yeah, you can't talk to them about fasting and what you're actually doing. And they're like wondering why we're having steak at like 10 in the morning, right? So it's kind of funny on that aspect, but yeah. Uh, so your husband eats with you guys eat together and that's his one meal. He eats at that time. And so he eats every day, but you still do. What's your schedule right now? Does it kind of change every week now that you're in maintenance or is it kind of just based on how you feel or how do you do that now? Both actually. It's based on how I feel, what I want to do. Um, right now I'm doing a 46 and then, um, um, then I will probably do another seven, uh, 68. I don't usually do 70 because by the time it comes around to a 70, that's two hours further. So I want to eat before 10 in the morning. So I always have 68, 69. That's why it always sounds kind of odd, not a 72, because that would take me back up to almost noon. I think that's important too. Some people get stuck up on, and I was like that for a while, like it has to be an exact like 48 because that's two days or 72 because it's three days. And it's more important probably you would say, like the time that you eat rather than having a set, you know, Absolutely. Schedule of a specific number of hours. Absolutely. You can, it's your journey and you pick what hours you want, what, what time you want to do it, what, what works best for you. That's the most important thing. This is your journey. I tell my ladies, we're all on the same journey, but we're just taking different paths. We're still beside each other, walking beside each other. But we're just taking different paths and we're all going to meet at the end with great health and, and happiness. So what would be your biggest advice for someone who is just getting started in fasting? I know you're big on learning and you have your book recommendations and all of that, but is there specific advice that you would recommend for someone? And then also if there's someone who's tried fasting and they're struggling, they just feel like they can't do it. What would your advice be in that situation as well? My number one, number, number, number one thing is please, you have to have support. You have to have support. This is for the first year and a half. I had no support. I had no Instagram. I had no one to talk to about it. It was very difficult. It was actually depressing. I was very sad doing it. I knew, I knew that, um, that when the, when the weight started coming off, I knew that it was working. It was going to work. Everything would be okay, but it was still very lonely. 
um, to do it on my own. That's why I reach out on Instagram and I'm, and I'm helping women. I'm encouraging them. I'm supporting them because I don't want anybody to be alone. Now, the women that I have uh, supported and encouraged have come back to me and they are very, very thrilled. They're very excited. They're very grateful because even being on Instagram, watching other people do their fasting and stuff and do their journey and talking to a few people here and there, they don't feel like they're part of something really. They don't feel like they're being supported. They don't feel like they're, they're, they're having anyone to do this with. So I also like to help my women by joining in with their fast or having them join me with a fast. Then when you're doing a fast with someone else or a few people, it feels even better because you're part of something really, really special. Yeah. You just, you don't want to feel like, I think a lot of people, they don't want to feel like they're letting someone else down either. You know, when they're, when they're doing the fast together, it's kind of like, oh, well, I really want to eat that cookie, but I know Carol's fasting. <laughs> So if yeah. she can do it, I can do it. Yeah. When you get that support, it's really good for accountability. So, because you want to be accountable to yourself, but when you're accountable to yourself, that's one thing, but when you're accountable to somebody else, that's a whole different thing. So you want to work even harder. That in turn will make you dig deeper inside for the strength that you're going to find. You will find, we all have that inner strength. And that is a beautiful thing. Once you find that and you're able to hang on to that and carry that through any and every fast and then through your lifestyle, you won't even have to go looking for that strength anymore because you're just going to have, it's just going to be there. It's going to be part of like your exercising muscle to um, build up on with your fasting. You're going to find that inner strength and you're just going to be able to hang on to it. Yeah. I think accountability is important too, because it's not people look at accountability the wrong way. Sometimes I think they see it like you're being sent to the principal's office. If you got to answer to somebody, but I think sometimes it's important because you can get a positive feedback and positive encouragement or it's like you can't think of your accountability partner as like going to the principal's office you know I think that with the accountability part of it I think you have to have a good a good honest clean mindset you can't have a, a negative you can't you can't be negative in this it has to be this has to be a positive experience a positive a pleasant place for you to be in all aspects of it now I'm not saying it's really easy to do fasting I mean it is difficult once you first but the first two weeks are probably your most difficult once you get past that first two weeks things just start flowing and it's just it becomes such a beautiful way of life and it just becomes easier and easier as you go along it's, it's an amazing journey yeah I think your mindset is what makes it easier you know it's not so much that it's easier physically like it does feel easier physically but I think it's more how you see things and how your mindset is that makes it feel so much easier. At least that's been the case for me. There's so much in our culture where people, people think like you get hungry. It's like a panic, you know, like they panic when they get hungry. Like I have to eat, right? It's like, okay, what happens if you don't eat when you're hungry? Well, nothing happens that Pat, that feeling passes for me. It's like 15, 20 minutes at the most, you know, I know you were saying two minutes, but sometimes it lasts a little bit longer for me, but even now I don't ever hardly ever get hungry at all. It's just that I want to eat, you know, <laughs> it's more of the food addiction of just enjoying food. And I'm definitely a foodie. I love food. So for me, it's just that mental side of, you know, no, it's not a panic every time you have to eat. And I used to get hangry. My husband, that was another reason he was so concerned when I said I was going to start fasting. Besides the fact that I've done so many crazy diets, he was like, here we go again you know? <laughs> and of course it didn't take him long to jump on board. And he does 16, eight, he doesn't have any weight to lose. He lost like 75 pounds way back in high school. And he's kept that off um, all these years, but for him doing the 16, eight, he enjoys that. Cause they feel like it gives him a little more flexibility and he's able to maintain his weight easier. I like your mind, your mindset thing too. I call it the mindset shift. You shift your mind to what you want. You set it and you do it because fasting is not a punishment. It's not any kind of deprivation this is a choice. This is a, an, an honest, you know, mindset choice that you're doing. Um, you're not, you're not going to be hurting your body. You're going to be helping your body. You're going to be healing your body again with the rest and recovery that I, that I've been talking about. I'm never someone who really does well with like negative reinforcement, you know? And so I found being, being kind to myself is actually way more motivating for me than negative. And I think fasting has helped with that as well. You're not just releasing weight. You're also, doing things that are so good for your health, it really does become more focused on your health. And it makes you helps you to kind of get through those periods where maybe you aren't losing what you want to lose. You still know that fasting is doing something for your body, even if you're not seeing it on the scale. I have a really hard time talking about the fact that I never went on all kinds of diets. I've never been a dieter. I've never been a foodie. So I don't like to talk about that too much because I don't want to come across or come off as um, in any kind of arrogant or conceited kind of way that you know, well, I never had a foodie problem. I never had a diet problem. Yeah. Like, I never did any other diets ever. I, I did. I tried some diet pills. Christina, when I was um, 
I think it was about 36 or 37. I tried these diet pills. I took them for, there was, there were, there were two bottles in the package and I tried them for two months. So I bought two separate boxes and, um, one was you take it when you eat and then the other one you take two before you eat and two after you, I don't even remember what it was some kind of slim something. And I took them for two months and I was only, like I said, 36, 37. And that's when my period stopped from those freaking pills. Wow. <laughs> well, I mean, you've never been on diet, but you were, you were a Pepsi addict, weren't you? And that's a big one for a lot of people. I wasn't a, I wasn't a foodie because I had my, I had my sugar. I had my, my liquid sugar. I, I, I could drink between six and eight liters of Pepsi a day. I mean, I was an absolute wow. monster. Yeah, yeah. That's a lot. <laughs> and I was drinking Pepsi or Coke, depending on which I switched back and forth, depending on which one I liked at the, at the present time. But I was drinking Pepsi since I was 12 years old. Um, my, my grandfather couldn't believe that my stomach was not rotted out or that my teeth weren't rotted out of my head for, of my head for the, the amount of Pepsi, the amount of sugar, the amount of chemicals in that. I stopped drinking Pepsi, you know, a few times. Uh, one time I stopped for five years, one time I stopped for three years and then just hopped back on that again. So I know that was a big factor with my weight and my hormones not being balanced. So again, I wasn't a foodie. I wasn't really into food. To me, food was like a chore. It was a, oh, I got to eat. I don't really feel like eating. And I just drink my Pepsi and be happy and nice and full. And again, you know, once you hit that 32, 35 year mark, that's when our hormones really start to fluctuate. So, you know, putting all that sugar into the equation, of course, is going to raise my, my weight up. But uh, so when the year I started uh, fasting in March of 2018 and in uh, January of 2018, I decided to quit, quit my Pepsi again, which I did. And not, not, this is before I knew about fasting. So I'd already had a bit of a head start because now my Pepsi was already out of the equation, which was great, which really helped with letting go of the weight once my hormones were balanced. Um, so it's been uh, three years now, three years and I think almost six months that I've been off the Pepsi as well, never going to go back. And it's really funny because I actually bought Pepsi uh, about a week and a half ago. And I thought to my husband, I said, well, I'm going to, I'm going to buy some Pepsi. I can have a Pepsi every now and then. It's not a big deal. I have a seven up. We buy those little teeny tiny brand new cans. They come in six packs, right? I just, they, they're the cutest little pops, right? And so we bought a six pack of the Pepsi and, and I'm telling you, I had a sip and I swallowed it and I was just, I was mortified. So I thought, well, maybe it kind of went rancid or something. So I had another sip and I had to go to the sink and spit it out. For the first time in my life, I could actually taste the chemicals in it, the food coloring. I don't know what, but it was the worst thing I've ever tasted in my life. And I lived on that stuff. So without meaning to change my brain has now changed and, and said, no, this is not something that you're going to ingest. You're going to like, we don't like your body's healthy now. We're not letting that come into the equation. So that would, and my husband was so curious. He's like, you know, cause I poured it down the sink. I was like, it's horrible. I couldn't even speak. I was just like, oh. <laughs> so he went and he got one and he cracked it and he said, it tastes fine. And I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it that it wasn't rancid because to me it tasted just rancid, but for going and, and I know and it wasn't from not drinking it for three years either because like I said I've drank I've been I've quit drinking it for five years in the past and always came back to it but with the fasting lifestyle as you were saying Christina about how how we change um how our bodies want the healthy foods and how our brain has now decided on we want health and healthy taste health healthy choices even another example is my Caesar salad I just worship Caesar salads I love them I know they're not that healthy it's just lettuce and a little bit of you know uh, Caesar salad dressing or whatever, but I loved that lettuce. And I had a Caesar salad about a month and a half ago and I could not, I did not like it at all. I will never ever have it again. The texture of this, of the lettuce now, even the taste of it, it's just something that my body just didn't like anymore. It was, it was really shocking to me to, to go back to something that I haven't had for a while, taste it. And, and my body say, no, not for me. Even if it's foods that are healthy or not necessarily bad for you, sometimes your body knows like, nope, you don't respond well to this. And again, that's what I love so much about fasting, because if you just told yourself, I can never have a Pepsi ever again for the rest of my life, because I'm going to gain weight. And this is what I have to do. It's, it's like such a sacrifice mentality of like, well, poor me, I can't drink Pepsi and stay thin. Other people can, but when you're like, no, I'm doing this lifestyle. I can have a Pepsi if I want to, if I choose not to have one or have one. And then your body's like, nope. And now you're like, oh, I don't want that stuff. <laughs> That's for me. It's like, I don't fantasize about certain foods and, or drinks or whatever that it's like, ah, eh. you know, I think with the diet culture and mentality, you get so focused on like just wanting those things. And that's all you can think about when you're like, no, you can never have 
piece of cake ever again. And I think you and I both had mentioned that we both had cake recently. We were talking about this on Instagram and it just didn't taste the same. You know, like it's, it's just not, I feel like some things you would have a bite and you'd have to keep eating. Now it's like, I have a bite of something like that. And I'm like, eh. you know, it's, it's not necessarily like a big thing anymore. It's really funny because it's the same thing with uh, going outside and smelling. If you're walking past McDonald's, you're walking past Wendy's or any of those fast food joints and you, you smell that smell and you, and you used to think, oh, that smells good. It can smell. You thought it was the French fries. You thought that smell was the French fries. And you realize now with, with what you've learned, like also another thing that I learned about was oils, the good oils, the good extra virgin olive oils, they have to say cold pressed or first pressed, or they're just not, not a good, not a good oil to, to have in your home or avocado oil, which is really good. So we're outside and we're smelling this smell. And we used to think, oh, it smells so good. I'd love some fries or something, you know, but now when we're outside, my husband and I, and we're smelling this, we're like, oh, that's the rancid oil. That's the oil that's no good for you and it just now it actually stinks now it actually smells bad you could probably make you hungry huh mindset that we were that we were taught to believe that that smell was a good smell and our bodies was were taught our bodies have been taught that that was a good smell now we smell it and we realize that is just not a healthy smell that's not a good smell so that's really neat to, to, to have that experience as well another thing was if you like when you're going to come off your fast say tomorrow and you think, oh, I'd really like pizza tomorrow or a, or a hamburger or, you know, whatever you'd like. But then if tomorrow comes and then it's time for your feast and you've done this incredible, beautiful thing of a fast, which I call it, I call it a gift for your body. You've done this amazing gift for your body now. Now it's the next day and you, you last night you really wanted a pizza because maybe you saw someone on TV having a pizza in one of your shows or having a burger. Yeah. Oh, I'd love a burger and some fries or whatever. But when you get up the next morning and it's your feast day, now you're rethinking things because now you're like, you know what? This is my feast day. This is my feast time. This is my gift. Again, another gift. Fasting is a gift. The feast is a gift. This is a, uh, a beautiful thing for me. I don't think I want to ruin it with pizza. I want something healthy. I want something that I'm really going to enjoy, that my body's really going to enjoy. Something for me. So that's a really neat thing to experience as well. Yeah, I think it's kind of like imp impulse purchases at the grocery store by the counter. It's kind of like we had impulse meals. You see somebody eating something, it smells good and you just eat it. And then after you're like, oh, but when you have like that time to think about it and you're like, oh yeah, this is what I'm getting when it's time to eat. And you go to eat, sometimes you'll even go to start eating it. And you're like, oh, that's for me. Like I'll start to eat something that's not healthy. And then I'm like, I really don't even want this. I'll just put it aside and go get something else. So it's really cool to see your body naturally progress towards health and it doesn't have to be so restrictive. And I think that's how, that's the reason for me as a cereal dieter that I feel like fasting is finally the thing that is a lifelong way of living and not just another diet to be on. Nothing else has ever changed my habits in this way without me feeling like I'm forcing it constantly. I know you and I both are on the same page where we don't want people to think like, okay, you have to do two, three, four, five day fast in order to do this. You can be doing 16 or 20 hour fast and kind of progress more if you want. What do you think is probably a good starting point for people? Well, I just believe that um, if somebody really wants to get into this and they want to test the waters and they want to learn, I would love to coach anybody who wants to learn and get into the lifestyle. I don't charge any money. I never would. I never will. Because of my year and a half, almost year and a half of being alone, again, I don't want anyone to be out there alone. So I want to help as many people as I can, again, for free, because it's just such a beautiful, attainable, sustainable lifestyle. And I'm so very passionate about it. I would say, I would really recommend that if you're interested and you want to do it, that you try it for two weeks. And what I would do is I would take you through what you want to do for you, whether you want to do a, a OMAD, whether you want to eat two meals a day, depending on your times, I'd have to talk to you. I'd have to see what your schedule is like. If you work full time, if you come home, if you have kids, if you're married or not, there's so many different aspects to what kind of a fast you would yourself want to do and be able to do because it has to be sustainable for you. Otherwise it's just going to get frustrating for you and you're just going to end up not wanting to do it. I would recommend two weeks um, to start and Again, I would help you learn what, what you need to do for yourself and how you would do you, how it would be for you, again, with learning about you first to be able to help you. I can't just tell you what to do or, or even suggest you what to do because I don't know your personal life, your personal history. But again, I would love to um, uh, help and support and uh, encourage. Yeah, so if someone who is in a really high stress 
job where they they are not getting enough adequate rest they probably would want to start out a little slower because i know we talk you and i talk about this a lot where I, I was having a hard time doing my longer fast now and i realized i needed to rest more but i'm a stay-at-home mom so i can do that now and so i've made it a priority instead of running around getting 20 things done over the last couple of weeks i made it a priority to actually rest lay down try to take a nap when my girls are napping in the afternoon and that's allowed me to do my longer fast so people who i guess maybe they can't nap during the day most people can if they have a job what would you suggest just go to bed earlier my big recommendation would be when you get home from work just lay down for 20 minutes half an hour even 40 minutes you do not have to sleep just lay down and rest because you're in your fast you're you're Again, you're stressing your body, although it's a good stress. If you have that rest before, even if it's before bed, I mean, like, you know, six o'clock, seven o'clock at night, just try not to fall asleep because you don't want to fall asleep that close to bedtime. Obviously, it's going to mess with your, your skin. Rhythm. You can rest for 20 minutes. Just lay on the couch. Just unwind. Just let your body because because fasting is resting and recovering. And part of that is the resting, right? So if you're working all day long, you come home, you want to rest, please. Re resting is recommended with fasting. I mean, it's rest and recovery. That's what it is. Your body is healing. It's in a, it's in a healing state. So definitely. I think, I think that's a lot of people are missing that point. You know, I know I was of like more rest. Cause I get a lot of sleep. I get adequate sleep at night, but just doing that, like rest in the middle of the day, or I think maybe some people, if they can go in their car and rest during their lunch break or something like that. I know my husband used to do that in the past where he would just kind of like 20 minutes in his car. And I mean, resting is not encouraged just for fasters. It's for, it's encouraged for everybody. Right. People are so stereotypically scared of, of having a rest, having a lay down, having a nap because they're going to be looked at as lazy or, or, you know, useless or good for nothing. I mean, we all need to rest always, no matter what lifestyle we're in, even though we slept all night long, maybe we didn't get a good enough sleep. Maybe it was a troubled sleep. Maybe we thought we slept well, but we didn't. Our body is saying, no, we didn't sleep good enough. Having that rest, no matter what you're doing, what your life entails, having that rest is just an, uh, an amazing bonus for you. Yeah. So we talked about books a couple of times, but what would your top recommendations be for people who've never read anything on fasting or health, or what would you recommend for them to start with? Well, I do recommend that fasters uh, just beginning or fasters that are already in the lifestyle that haven't done any reading. I really, really highly encourage you to read. Um, this is, this is, this used to be my first pick, the Do Dr. Fung's Complete Guide to Fasting. That used to be my first pick. But now my first pick would be Delay, Don't Deny by Jen Stevens. It's a simple book. It's easy. It's um, very informative. It will only take you six to eight hours to read. Once you get through this, you'll have a little more basic information and you'll be able to, to um, progress from there. Once you have this absorbed, digested, thought about, and you're in your fasting and you're doing it, then I would definitely and highly recommend Dr. Jason Fung's Complete Guide to Fasting. It's a little more in-depth, a little more sciencey, but again, you will learn so much from this book. So I recommend that people read a book or two. If you want to read more, fine, but I think that just a book or two gets you started, gets you going. I think if you read too many books too fast, I think you're going to get kind of lost in stuff unless you're, you know, super into reading. That's great, wonderful. But if you're putting a, a brand new faster, you know, into a, you know, read this book, read that book, read that, I think you might lose them too because not only are you now having to read these books, you are having to do this fasting as well. And I think that the fasting itself takes so much focus just on doing the fasting it, it itself because your body is going through so many changes and stuff like that to just put too much on yourself. Like again, with exercising, I don't think you need to do a lot of exercising the first year. I didn't have to, maybe you will have to, I'm not sure. Maybe you'll want to, um, but I can tell you that exercising alone is not going to have you let go of weight. Again, it's a matter of balancing your hormones. You can exercise all you want. That's like saying you ate a uh, thousand calories of some food and you want to now uh, exercise and try to lose that thousand calories, you're going to have to exercise for like 60 hours to lose that. I mean, an example is my husband and I went for a bike ride uh, last week. We did 10 miles and 10 miles on the bicycle. And that was only about 260 calories. Now, if I sat down and ate a 2000 calorie meal and I only lost 235 or 260 calories, I mean, hello, that's the yeah. same kind of idea as calorie in, calorie out. Calorie counting is such a myth. Same thing. People are counting their calories and counting the calories. They're wasting their time. They're not understanding. You have 400 calories of a piece of chocolate cake and 400 calories of broccoli. It's not the same. You have 400 calories of spinach, 400 calories of ice cream. It's not the same. Literally rethink, use common sense, rethink this calorie counting, sit down, think about it, take some foods and do what I just did and think about the calories in calories out because it is an absolute myth.
I, I just, I'm just saying that to help people. Right. Well, I know. Yeah. As far as your satiety level, cause you're going to eat, you know, this much volume of something that's a healthier, like versus an unhealthy thing. It's a little tiny bit going in your stomach, but also with calorie counting, it does lower your metabolism, which I get that question a lot with fasting as well. And I talk to people about that, how fasting actually increases your metabolism. Actually, I was going to make a video on that in the future. I have a good video from Dr. Fung about how it actually does increase your metabolism. You know what, you know what, it's really frustrating to me too, is because like, um, because like Dr. Fung, Dr. Mindy, all of them want you to come into the fasting lifestyle. So they're, they're, you know, even in complete guided fasting, even in here in Jen Stevens book, you know, she says, it's okay if you have a little bit of creamer and it's okay if you have a little bit of bone broth and same with Dr. Fung. And they're saying this kind of stuff, Christina, because they don't want people to be deterred and not come into this lifestyle. But it just frustrates me because all the women that I'm getting and that I'm talking to, I'm telling them, no, 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 no. Fasting is simple. Fasting is water, 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 no bone broth, no cream in your coffee, no herbal teas, no cinnamon in your tea, no lemon in your water, you know, this kind of thing that they're hearing out there. That's okay. Well, you can, you can, it won't spike your insulin too much. And it's like, you know what, if you have to sit down and think about what you can have, what you can maybe have, what, what I could get away with. That's yeah. not, that's not if fasting is simple, there should be no overthinking. That's a huge thing I want to say is that fasting is a simple thing. There should be no overthinking to fasting because it's just, it's just a simple thing, right? I think it can sometimes help people to have those little crutches to get into the lifestyle yeah, yeah, and it can feel like you need that. that. But sometimes it's easier just to do it right the first time because so you kind of I think you have to, as someone who's getting into the fasting lifestyle, I think you have to stop and ask yourself, like, how, who are you? Are you a toe in the water kind of person? Or are you a jump in person? Because if you're going to give yourself, OK, all I'm going to have is cream in my car, like a little bit of cream in my coffee every day and that's it or, you know, some people say up to 50 calories, up to hundred calories, um, then that's going to be something else you have to cut out later. And then you're going to struggle cutting that out, you know, or if you just jump in and say, this is a new thing, it's all done. And if you're, and if you're having, if you're having those little things in your coffee and you're having those little things here and there, they're going to make you hungrier. So that's going to be super unbeneficial for you in the long run. And so it frustrates me because they say that, yeah, you can have this, you can have that because they want to draw these people in. They don't want to, they don't want to have them scared off. So it frustrates me like that. I don't make my women just have coffee. If they say, well, Carol, you know what? I really, really can't do that. I say, you know what? Okay, that's fine. Let's try for the first two weeks. If you have to have that cream in your coffee, let's try that for two weeks. And then after two weeks, let's talk again and let's see if you can weed that out. So don't think that I'm just this big, uh, right. You know, commander that well, says you can't have anything well that's the point that's the point i i, I did want to make is that if you feel like you have to have that or you're not going to start i mean go by all means go ahead but just know that your goal is going to be to get that out of your diet if you're having anything you know um and i know some people like you don't even have coffee black coffee at all which a lot of people do black coffee there's different things on that but you'll learn as i'm learning my body is tolerating that caffeine less and less on an empty stomach and so i've cut back more and more and more to where it probably eventually won't be a daily thing for me anymore which is cool because you're like oh i can never give up my coffee and that's kind of the progression i feel like Sometimes people are scared away by the ultra strict, like water only fasting. But I think, you know, if, if you're a toe dipper, toe in the water kind of person, just know you can start out that way, but ho have a goal in mind to not be that way forever and to eventually get to cleaner and cleaner fast. For me, before I started extended fasting in January, 2020, I actually, October the previous year had started doing 16, eight and I had tried um, 16, eight in the past. And I didn't have like notice any difference, have any results, but I was having just a tiny bit of measured out creamer in my coffee because so many people had said that you could, right. And I had no results. So I was like, well, intermittent fasting doesn't work for me. When I cut that out, it was like black coffee and water only. I immediately started losing one, two pounds a week, just doing the 16 and 18 hour fast. So I kind of like, um, quit that over the holidays. And then January, 2020 is when I started extending fast. But I think it's important for some people to realize that some people think that fasting doesn't work for them, but it could just be because they're adding in all this other stuff. And so it's not the fact that, you know, we want you to be real strict and you can't have it, but your results are going to be so much better. The autophagy, you don't know how much healing is going on behind the scenes. You can't see that your little bit of cream in your coffee might be stopping your body from being able to do the autophagy and all the healing that it's doing and like you like what you were saying about uh people having black coffee or some people even um have black tea so i just want to i just want to throw that out there that um when you're having tea and coffee 
anything with caffeine it when you're when you're fasting you're already like i said you're already stressing your body in, in doing a fast now you're adding coffee or tea into the equation and now you're doubly or triply um stressing your body because now your nervous system is being affected in a, in a huge way um because you're having this caffeine so you're now doubled doubled on you know stress um, some people get the jitters even worse because they have an empty stomach so they think oh yeah. i can't because something's going on, something's happening. I, I feel jittery. I don't feel good. I feel shaky. I feel kind of dizzy. Well, that's because the caffeine is working like triple time now because you are a fast, in a fasted state. You're a fasted person. Your body is trying to heal and you're putting this caffeine into you. Now your liver has to work harder filtering this coffee. Now your heart is pumping even harder and faster because you have the caffeine in you. And I believe caffeine is a stimulant anyway. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's very hard on your system when you're, when you're fasting. It really is. And I've actually been reading a lot lately that um, it actually leads to heart disease in women and cancer growth. I've been following some research, so I have a lot more research to do on that, but that has encouraged me to cut my caffeine back any, even more. But all that to say, really, I think that, I don't know, I think if people need crutches to feel like they're getting into the lifestyle, just know that your goal is going to be to eventually cut that out. So don't let, you know, don't let it stop you from starting this lifestyle if you're interested in trying this lifestyle, but just know that end goal is going to be to get that out. And if you can start and just go straight water only, that that would be, you're going to have the best results and it's not going to be like something you have to cut out later. But if you have to have those little small crutches, like you said, set a time frame. That's what, that would be my advice is like, okay, I'm going to cut my coffee back for a week, you know, or whatever it may be. If you're putting creamer in there, put a lot less and just kind of work your way back. It's your own journey. You have to do what you feel best doing. Um, and yeah, it doesn't have to be a, like, I don't know. That's all I like about fasting. So free, you know, it's not, we're not going to sit here and tell you, oh, you're doing it the wrong way. We're just going to tell you, like, Hey, this is the best way. And then, you know, do whatever you have to do to get you there getting started, I think is the hardest for a lot of people. And just thinking about not eating is enough. They don't also want to think about having to give up their caffeine and everything else. So it's a journey. And for me personally, I've never planned on giving up caffeine. I've given it up a few times over the years for like a few weeks or months at a time, but I am now like, again, a year and a half into my journey, I'm now learning my body is starting to react to it where it didn't before. So I drink probably less than a fourth of the amount of caffeine I used to drink. And so it's a big progression, but this last week I tried to give it up all together and I still got the worst headaches. And I'm like, it's a, it's, I mean, it's really, it's a, it's a drug, just like any other thing. I mean, it's very addictive. You know, it's really funny when I drank my coffee, most days after I finished my coffee by noon, I would want to go to sleep. Christina, I would just completely crash. It was unbelievable. Like it just, it just made me crash. Just like even when I with nothing it. in it, even with just, even with it being black, yeah. just black. I just would, I, I'd say to Eddie, I have to go lay down and I would actually fall asleep. Like I couldn't even, I couldn't even help it. I couldn't stay, couldn't even stay awake. We've talked a lot about weight loss and your journey as far as that's concerned, but we've also touched on health a little bit. So one big thing of health and fasting is autophagy. So can you touch on that just a little bit and kind of tell us a little bit about autophagy? Well, it's really funny because when I, when I first started my journey uh, three years and three months ago, autophagy uh, it's something that happens with our body. And it's kind of like if you remember the Pac-Man games where the little Pac-Man used to go and eat all the little yellow guys, mm -hmm. our body does that. Our body does that in, in what they call house cleaning. So all our older, dead, dying, moldy, terrible cells, uh, the bigger, the better cells are, are getting rid of those cells for us. So again, house cleaning. Um, they used to say that the autophagy took place between 16 and 18 hours. Now there's some conflicting information that it's more at 24 hours. So with Dr. Mindy, she's saying it's more into the 16 to 18. She's still kind of adamant about that time period. So now we're just kind of looking at your autophagy kicks in between 16 and 24 hours while you're into your fast. Um, it's an amazing thing because the longer you stay in your fast, the more autophagy you get, the healthier you get, the longer you fast year, two years, three years, you know, you're just getting nothing but more and more and more autophagy, um, more and more healthy. They're also saying that autophagy kicks off around 72 hours. Now there's no instruments, there's no ways to record or determine uh, what time you go into autophagy, how long it actually lasts. They're saying autophagy kicks off around 72 hours, like I said, but like with ketones, there is ketone readers. You can you use your urine, you can use blood, you can use your breath. So there are readers for ketones, you know, 
but again, not for autophagy. And they're not sure if they're ever gonna make anything for that. They don't know if they even can to read your autophagy uh, measurements. So that's kind of an interesting thing too. Yeah, it's crazy how much as like advanced as we are, there's still a lot of stuff that's unknown about fasting and there's still new things being discovered and things that used to speak of as fact, they're kind of like changing it now. <laughs> Yeah, that's an exciting part of, of fasting too, because when you're in this lifestyle, you're never going to stop learning. There's always going to be something that you learn, even if it's something you didn't know about, you know, like with me, I didn't even realize a few things, you know, three years ago that I've learned now that, that are really, you know, very extremely amazing for me. We had talked about the books and like, not everybody is a big reader. Do you have like videos that you recommend? that people watch if they're not into reading or if they want to do that first. Cause I could, I could definitely link those link those in the description below. If I get those from you after. Definitely. I would highly recommend uh, watching a lot of Dr. Mindy videos. Um, Dr. Jason Fung as well. I really enjoyed Thomas DeLauer. Uh, there's Dr. Ken Berry as well. Um, so there's a lot of good information out there. You just have to be careful what you listen to and who you listen to. And you have to remember also that all the information you find out um, is not necessarily going to work for you. There might be some things that just don't work for you. There's some things that don't work for me, but at least I, I tried it. I gave it a chance. I mean, life is just learning. Life is just constantly learning and evolving. So, well, so there, was there anything else that you wanted to mention before we kind of wrap it up? As you mentioned that I do a lot of coaching on Instagram and, um, if you want to have any kind of coaching or just any kind of support, um, with your journey or getting to come into the lifestyle, um, I do uh, what's called a meet and greet before I will allow you to follow me on Instagram, just so I know who, who is following me. I like to know all my followers. I like to see their faces. I like to see their eyes. I think there's so much loss in texting and you don't really get to know the person and know what they want, what they need, what they desire, what they want for their life. So again, I do meet and greets uh, to make sure that you're a good fit and that uh, I'm able to help you in a more productive manner than just texting with you, you know, and then scrolling back three days to what I said to you or yeah. what you said. It's just so frustrating. It's just so not uh, not um, an intimate way to to deal with somebody. Yeah, trying like to pers journey. more personal and absolutely. Yeah. So it's not a one size fit all, in your opinion. It's you have to make it work around your life and what works for you, and you have to test it on yourself. And yeah, absolutely. sometimes it's a matter of trial and error, kind of too, huh? So I don't think that you have to uh, do your life around fasting. I think that fasting has to go around your life and what you want and what you need and what your what your goals are. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's important getting out of those mindset of like restrictive diet mindset that a lot of us do have, you know, I've obviously I've struggled with that since I was probably like 10 years old, but yeah, with fasting, it's just so free freeing. And that's one thing you say all the time is like, there's no guilt in fasting. It's total freedom. And I just love the food freedom I found in it. So for anybody who is in this lifestyle or who's looking to get into this lifestyle, do you have any like final pieces of advice for them? I just want to let people know that there, the huge thing with fasting is there is no failed fast. If you need to quit your fast or let your fast go for any reason, you're having a bad day, your kids are screaming, your boss was yelling at you and you just cannot finish that fast. There are no failed fasts. I do not want women to feel ashamed. I don't want them to feel guilty. I don't want them to feel bad in any way. Letting a fast go is just part of the journey. It's just part of what happens sometimes. Yeah, I think acknowledging that is a big part of fitting fasting into your life and not having to fit your life around fasting like we do with these restricted diets. And, then, and another huge thing is what I call grace. You have to give yourself grace when you are not feeling well, when you want to let a fast go. That's when I tell my women that you give yourself that grace, that, that time to just not feel bad, not feel guilty. It's, it's called grace. Yeah, that's really good. I think that's a big one for me as well as learning to give myself grace. You and I have been talking about that a lot on Instagram and our little chats. So uh, thank you so much for doing this um, interview with me today. I'll link everything we talked about down below and I'll also link Carol's Instagram down below. So just know she will want to do the little meet and greet with you. And like she said, she's not selling anything but um, it's just more of a personal connection on her Instagram. Thank y'all so much for watching today's video. I hope you really enjoyed it. I hope it motivated and inspired you on your weight loss journey. I'll catch y'all in the next one. Bye.